This boy was 12 years old when Sierra Leone's brutal, decade-long civil war reached his village in January 1993. Soon he found himself swept up into the army, a child soldier. Eight years later, after rehabilitation and a new life with a family in America, he decided to come out and tell his story. In this video interview, he shares some of the insight he's gained from his experience and hope that other children can be spared. Repeating it. After a Southern California earthquake, scientists study to learn why certain buildings may have collapsed. But sometimes we can learn even more from the buildings that didn't collapse. If we see your experience as an earthquake and you as one of the strong buildings that survived, what can we learn from you about the factors that especially enabled you to cope and survive? I believe it had a lot to do with my early upbringing. Growing up in a community that had a very deep appreciation for life and respect for adults, I gained a very strong sense of family tradition. I think because of my early upbringing, I developed a sense of self. I was very strong, and even through the war, when everything seemed to have been wiped out, there was still something present, because that very short childhood I had was so remarkable. That belief that something could change is what kept you going then? The belief that something could change. Because you see, I remember when I was a kid, my father used to tell me that as long as you are alive, there is a possibility for something to change in your life. Now, it could be good or bad, but something will change. So when I was running, I kept that thought. If I am still alive, there is still hope that this could end and that I could survive. That didn't turn out to be the case for quite a while, but eventually, it did. Very little. The thing about living in this context was that there was very little time to grieve for the people you lost and everything else you lost. But even if there was, that might also kill you because there is so much that you see and there is so much that you're exposed to. Grieving would almost be accepting defeat in a way that in a normal circumstance is not the case. No, I wasn't able to grieve until afterwards when I was at the rehabilitation center. There I did. But before that, I went through the emotion of feeling severe pain, of not wanting to be alive. I had feelings of that sort, but I didn't have much time to grieve because we had to keep going. Feeling remorseful or being incredibly sad was not something that could <coughs> propel you. The kinds of battles... You were taught by the army to envision the enemy as those who were responsible for killing your family. Even though you did this in battle, none of the killing made you feel any better about your loss. Instead, you said there was further loss, a temporary loss of your humanity. Do you feel anger about any of this? Yes. At some point I felt deep anger, but I don't think I'm bitter. I feel anger because I want something to be done to prevent this from happening to other people, and I try to do that. But I'm not angry in the sense that I want the same things that happened to me to happen to them or that I want them to die or anything. I just don't want this to continue happening to children. One thing that I learned the hard way, which I hope other people will not learn the hard way, nothing good comes out of this anger, this need for retaliation, for brutal payback. You cannot be in a position to understand how to prevent the problem if you do not speak with those who have hurt you. It's important to try to understand why this fellow who, perhaps years before the war, would have helped you, would have fed you, would be one of the active members of your community. How did he come to think, how did he come to be responsible for doing so much harm to you? I think if you don't engage in a conversation with him, you can't understand that. But I want people to be held accountable, so every now and then I feel angry. It's a common human tendency. But not to the point that I want revenge or anything. That doesn't do anyone any good. I wonder. You've been talking about not wanting this to keep happening. And I know they've managed to bring the numbers down a little bit. What's really going to change the problem? Well, what we are really working for is enough political will in the international scene to prevent these wars from actually occurring. Preventive measures. Because once war has started in most places, eventually women and children will get abused and children will get recruited. That's just the natural progression. So it's the preventive aspect that we are working towards. That's a long-term goal because most nations are not interested in doing anything that doesn't directly affect them and their people. But the short-term goal is to actually help the children who have been affected or the people in the communities who have been affected. In a lot of places that's possible.
people are doing it effectively. And by doing so, perhaps we can lessen the number of children who go into soldiering. Also, there is a way of enhancing international standards that bring people to justice, and this is being done. Now, I'm not naive. The problem is big. It's a global issue, so sometimes when even five, six, seven solid steps are taken, it seems as if nothing is happening because the problem is so big. But I don't want anyone to despair because I think it's possible to prevent the use of children in war as long as we create enough public awareness and bring enough government attention to it. You had some friends that didn't make it. Why did you survive when, when they didn't? I think in the context of the war, especially as we were running from it, we had to have hope, regardless of how little it was. Even if it meant celebrating, just having a chance to stop and drink clean water. Once you lose hope, you lose the determination to continue running during the context of war. Now this is not just specific to Africa, but to any war. You are happy just to receive a loaf of bread because you are holding on to that hope. The one that gives you strength to live through the next thing. Particularly for one of my friends, the thing that happened to him was that he lost hope while traveling. He felt that each time someone came upon us and tried to kill us, he lost a part of himself. He couldn't see the possibility that this would end someday, so he lost the strength to continue running. I believe that when your spirit stops striving to move forward, you lose hope. When we were running, obviously the situation was hopeless, but we always felt that something new could happen. We always hoped that, oh, tomorrow, maybe something will be good. Maybe sometimes we didn't believe it, but we had to try to believe it. There was just no other choice.